Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 36. Henry IV is coming home. Today we'll talk about the return of Henry IV to Germany and how he brings the civil war to at least a more than temporary halt. Before we start, just a reminder. The History of the Germans podcast is advertising free thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com. You'll find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Tom and Michael who've already signed up. Last week we left Henry IV celebrating his coronation in Rome. The ceremonies of emperor-making had become ever more elaborate since Pope Leo had surprised Charlemagne by putting a crown on his head on Christmas Day 800. The ceremonies lasted four days, during which the emperor entered five churches. St. Peter, St. John Lateran, St. Paul outside the walls, Santa Maria Maggiore and the Church of the Holy Cross. For the main events, the consecration on March 31st and the coronation on April 1st, the emperor wore a linen tunic embroidered with gold and precious jewels, the imperial mantle, golden spurs and the imperial sword. On his hands he wore linen gloves and the episcopal ring and on his head the imperial diadem. He went in procession to St. Peter's carrying in his left the golden orb which signifies the government of all the kingdoms and in his right the scepter of empire in the manner of Julius, Octavian and Tiberius was preceded by the empire's great treasures, the double relic of the Holy Lance of the leader of the Theban legion, St. Maurice, which had been refashioned so as to contain a nail of the Holy Cross. These relics were followed by the venerable order of bishops, abbots, priests and innumerable clergy, followed by the emperor, accompanied by the pope and the archbishop of Milan, and they were again followed by the dukes, the markgrafs, the counts and the orders of the various princes. It was like in the good old days of his father Henry III. But the only fly in the ointment was that the previous, and to many only legitimate, Pope Gregory VII shouted bands of excommunication and probably other things down on the procession as it crossed the Tiber Bridge below the Castello di Sant'Angelo. Unbeknownst to Gregory, in his futile rage, help was on its way. Robert Giscard, Duke of Apulia and most senior of the Norman leaders in southern Italy had mustered an army of allegedly 36,000 men to bring relief to Rome. This army had been put together in a rush as Robert wanted to prevent Henry from invading his territory as Henry had promised the Basileus in Constantinople. With time being of the essence he took all comers and promised them the earth. Normans for sure formed the core but he also hired southern Italians, Greeks, Albanians, Byzantines, allegedly even some of King Harold's men who had fought against the Normans at Hastings. But most shocking of all, a large part of his army consisted of the Saracen militia from Sicily, who were not only allowed, but encouraged to retain their Muslim faith. These were the men who came to free the Vicar of Christ. When Robert approached Rome from the south by the end of May, Henry, his Pope Clement III and his army left for the north of Italy. Without a single arrow shot, a single stroke of the sword, not a single lance thrown, Robert Giscard entered Rome and freed Pope Gregory from his refuge on the Castello di Sant'Angelo. German historians have often wondered why Henry gave up Rome, a city he had besieged for four years and that had cost him a gargantuan amount of blood, treasure and time. Why did he give up a city that was a symbol of his empire and that still held a pope he needed to have removed? I find the answer is fairly obvious. Rome in 1084 was an odd shape. Its ancient Aurelian walls encircled an area that held almost a million people when they were built in the 3rd century. By 1084, at best, 50,000 people lived in that city. Defending these walls required either an extremely large army or a militia of volunteers who would stand watch. The Romans may have been exhausted enough to fall for Henry's bribery and let him in, 
but that is not at all the same as being willing to fight to the death for a German emperor against the allies of a pope they had themselves raised to the throne of St. Peter. Without the full support of the Roman population and with the size of his army, Henry could not hold Rome, even at the best of times. And no medieval emperor had even tried it since Otto III. But it wasn't the best of times. The largest of Rome's fortresses, the Castello di Sant'Angelo, was still in the hands of Gregory VII. And so were two others. The capital was held by the Corsi family, and parts of the palace of the ancient emperor Septimus Severus were held by a nephew of Gregory VII. But the main reason to leave Rome is the one that listeners of this podcast are so very familiar with. Malaria. It is May, and in May is when the Germans die in Rome. Three days before Robert Giscard's arrival, Pope Clement III retires to Tivoli, and Henry begins a gentle progress into northern Italy. Again, German historians have described that as being a flight, even though the timeline that can be created from the locations of imperial charters along the way show that it was a typical slow imperial progress, not a flight. All Giscard wanted was to protect his lands, and once the emperor had handed Rome back to the Gregorians, he could no longer attack the south of Italy. The people who had to fear Robert Giscard were the Romans. Giscard's army had not come to fight for church reform and the freedom of Gregory VII, his greatest advocate. They had come for plunder. When they arrived and realized that both the papal and the imperial treasury had left or were out of reach, Giscard's soldiers began to go from door to door, taking all that was left from a population that had just endured four years of consecutive sieges. With nothing to be had to satisfy their demands, they turned to violence. They flattened a considerable part of the city between the churches of San Lorenzo and San Silvestro in the north and between the Colosseum and the Lateran Palace. Finally, they set fire to what was left of the imperial palaces on the Palatine and many other churches. They even raided the Vatican. This sack of Rome stands in a line with the more famous sack of Rome by the Goths in 408 and a sacco di Roma by the troops of Emperor Charles V in 1527. The chronicler Ildebrandt of Tours described Rome 20 years later still as a desert strewn with ruins. The sack also led to the demise of the previously all-powerful clans of the Crescenti and the Theophylacts. Their power had been fading ever since the church reformers had taken control over the papacy, but after 1084, they are being replaced by an emerging new aristocracy of Rome. These new families will all to be known as the Colonna and the Orsini. These families will rise within the papal administration and dominate Roman politics from now on. A more immediate effect of the sack was that Gregory VII's position in Rome had become untenable. The population, who had suffered four sieges on his behalf, endured his stubborn refusal to compromise, lost it completely when the papal relief troops stole their meagre remaining possessions and raped their wives and daughters. Gregory VII had to leave in the baggage train of Robert Giscard's troops. Robert installed him in the town of Salerno, where he kept writing to all and sundry, asking to support the one true Pope or be excommunicated for not doing so. Nobody came, and in 1085, Gregory VII died in Salerno. His last words were, I have loved justice and hated iniquity. That is why I die in exile. We will do a whole episode on the significance of these 50 years between 1070 and 1120, but it is still worth reflecting on Gregory for a moment. Even though he ends his life in defeat, he was one of the most important popes in the history of the Church. He had dominated the papacy long before he took the Holy See himself. Over these 40 years he relentlessly pursued his aim of making the papacy independent and superior to secular rulers and to improve the Church's moral standards. Even if I personally think that some of his reforms, particularly the celibacy of the clergy, had brought untold pain to both the members of the Church itself and their adherents. I do admire Gregory's unwavering commitment 
he did not care about his own life or the life of his supporters when he resisted Henry IV alone in the Castello di Sant'Angelo for nearly two years. His genius was not in theology. In fact, most would argue that Peter Damien or Humbert of Silva Candida were much deeper thinkers and the true intellectual powerhouses of church reform. Gregory just copied what he liked from there and stubbornly stuck with it. His real genius was public relations. With very few exceptions, all chroniclers have sided with Gregory against Henry. For some, this was simply a function of their role, like Bruno and Lambert of Hersfeld, but for most, it was a choice. Gregory managed to portray his acts, not as acts he undertook as an individual, but as a channel of the apostles or of God himself. And that allowed him to portray his ultimate defeat, not as a failure of his policies, but as a martyrdom for the cause. That is why his vision of the role of the papacy and the standards of moral rectitude survived his demise. Ten years after his death, Pope Urban II, his direct successor, will call Christendom to its most ambitious and most ill-fated endeavour, the Crusades. Without Gregory, no Pope would have dared to call a crusade, nor would have any secular ruler understood why he should follow his call. When Henry IV hears about the demise of his archenemy, he is back in Germany. After leaving Rome, he had spent some time arranging the affairs of northern Italy. He had placed his 11-year-old son Conrad in the care of the Italian bishops as a focal point for the imperial power in Italy. Henry returns to a country devastated by more than a decade of relentless war. Saxony and parts of Swabia are still in the hands of the rebels. Henry's main support base is Bavaria, the Rhineland, namely the archbishops of Mainz, Cologne and Trier, and the lands of Frederick of Hohenstaufen. On the outside, it seems not much has changed. But stripping away the outer layers, a lot has changed. Henry seems to have realized that his previous policies have failed. Acting as an autocratic ruler towards the princes of the imperial church system was no longer possible. He would not even be able to carve out his own territorial lordship as he had tried around the Harzburg. His new policy could be best described as a back-to-basics approach. After 1085, he would be very careful with the appointment of bishops. Rather than running roughshod over the cathedral canon's right to election, Henry would make sure that any of the bishops would be elected in line with canon law. He would choose candidates who had impeccable credentials both as scholars and as pastoral leaders. There would usually be canons already and he supported candidates who were recognized for their efforts in implementing church reform. All he asked for is for them to be loyal to him and his Pope Clement III. He would be particularly careful in choosing bishops for the episcopal sees of his enemies. Pope Clement III had excommunicated and deposed all the bishops who supported the rebels, in particular the archbishops of Salzburg and Magdeburg, the bishops of Würzburg, Halberstadt, Hildesheim and many other Saxon sees. Henry could now go and appoint new bishops for these dioceses. Apart from the above credentials, he also made sure that the new bishops had strong support in their diocese, usually because they were members of a local aristocratic clan. In that way, he gradually dragged more and more parts of the country to his side. His approach to secular princes also changed. When before he would just order them around and rarely listen to their advice, he now included them in his inner circle. Henry still relied on his ministerialis, but these themselves gradually turned into aristocrats, building castles and marrying into the great families of the realm. It was not just the inner workings of the regime that made it more attractive, it was also that the opposition had weakened. The two towering figures of the early years of the rebellion, Rudolf von Rheinfelden and Otto von Nordheim, are both dead. The new anti-king Hermann of Salm never really managed to get a foothold, largely because he was not as rich or as powerful in his own right as his predecessor. On top of that, the death of Otto von Nordheim created a power vacuum in Saxony, where various magnates competed for leadership. The Archbishop of Magdeburg, the Markgraf of Meissen, various sons of Otto von Nordheim, and the actual Duke of Saxony, 
the struggle for leadership was often brutal and did not stop at murder. Henry IV tried to take advantage of the disarray and invaded Saxony on multiple occasions. Bruno's history of the Saxon War counts a total of 15 invasions over the 17 years the war had lasted. But none of these invasions was successful. Every time Henry managed to bring his troops into Saxony, the warring factions united against the external enemy, whilst Henry's own army fell apart under the frictions between his warlords. I'm not going to take you through the back and forth of these four years of fighting. It ended around 1089, after some of the most stubborn opponents of Henry IV had died, and Henry offered a compromise acceptable to all. He promised not to go back to Saxony, neither in peace nor in war, to respect the ancient rights of the Saxons that went back to Charlemagne, and allowed the Saxons to rule themselves as they liked. He embraced Hartwig, Archbishop of Magdeburg and one of the leaders of the Saxon rebellion since the very beginning as a member of his court and his inner circle of advisers. I like I.S. Robinson's description of this solution as a vice-regal system of government. The leaders of the Saxons were allowed to do more or less as they liked as long as they formally professed allegiance to the emperor and refrained from military action. As for the other main opposition group around Welf IV, former Duke of Bavaria, and Berthold von Zeringen, former Duke of Carinthia, a solution was harder to find. By now, the two lords have turned their fortified keeps on the tops of mountains in the Upper Rhine in Switzerland into impregnable string of fortresses. They enjoyed the support of some of the most revered bishops of the realm, including Gebhard von Salzburg, Altmann von Passau and Adalbert of Würzburg. Though these guys all had lost their dioceses to Henry's appointees, they carried moral authority, further underpinned by the Gregorian papal legate, Odo, Cardinal Bishop of Ostia. They offered peace on condition that Henry would recognize Gregory's successor, Victor III, as the true pope and accept the excommunication of his pope, Clement III. Now, that was impossible, since it would invalidate Henry's own coronation as emperor. So the only possible strategy for Henry was to keep the pressure on, and wait for the old bishops to die. That they did, albeit slowly. But by 1089, the contingent of truly Gregorian bishops in Germany was down to six, only one of them holding his own diocese. Hence, the kingdom was largely at peace for the first time since 1073. But this peace is very different to the peace under Henry III in the 1040s. Henry III had ensured his peace through regular reconciliation assemblies, where he would forgive his enemies and his enemies would forgive him before everybody present would reconcile with everyone else. These peace happenings were followed up with imperial edicts banning feuds and those edicts would be enforced by imperial troops. His son, Henry IV, was no longer able to mandate peace in his realm. His aristocrats had used the preceding decades to build castles on their lands, increasingly in stone, that provided shelter from even the largest of armies. These castellans would settle their differences by raiding and pillaging their opponents' lands, very much as has been the case in Capetian France for a hundred years. Central power had deteriorated so much that the bishops had to step in and declare a peace of God for their diocese, banning fighting during certain periods of the year. In 1082, Henry IV himself declared a peace of God, together with his bishops. This time, there was no edict of the king. Sanctions of the breach of the peace of God were spiritual, not secular. No imperial army would attack the castle of a castellan who breached the peace. Henry had no military or political capacity to stop the feuding between his vassals. Where he intervened, such as in the case of a feud between the Archbishop of Salzburg and a local count, it was by bribing both sides with royal lands. Whilst this rule stabilised, Henry had also been able to improve the position on the eastern border. Hungary had been lost to the empire for a long time already, despite the occasional marriage alliance. But the threat of Hungarian power meant that the Duke of Bohemia was looking for a closer association with the empire. 
Ratislav II, Duke of Bohemia, had been one of the most reliable of Henry's allies all the way since 1075. In recognition for his loyalty, he raised him to be King of Bohemia. The royal title, however, came with a kink. It was a personal title, i.e. the sons of Ratislav would not be kings, unless the title was personally conferred on them by the emperor. To soften this blow, he had Prague raised to be an archbishopric, no longer reporting to Mainz, but now to Rome, a privilege the Dukes of Poland and the Kings of Hungary had been enjoying for quite some time, and the Bohemians really, really wanted. Even Poland came gradually back into the fold. The Polish rulers had used the weakness of imperial rule during the 1070s to distance themselves from the empire. That was made easier by the fact that the Saxons, Poland's neighbours, were busy fighting the royal armies rather than attacking Poland. When Henry returned from Rome, the equation changed again, and Poland saw a benefit in supporting the emperor as a counterweight to the Saxons. On the western border of the empire, the situation had remained challenging. You may remember the endless wars between Henry III and Godfrey the Bearded. There was a period in the 1060s-1070s where the situation had improved for the imperial side, and Agnes had arranged a peace agreement with the Counts of Flanders and the Counts of Holland that held at least for a while. When Godfrey the Bearded's son, Godfrey the Hunchback, became Duke of Lower Lothringia, things improved even further. Godfrey the Hunchback had been one of Henry's great supporters and a potential trump card when he first contemplated a journey to Italy. I mentioned this Godfrey some episodes ago because he had been married to none other than the great Countess Matilda of Tuscany. But that marriage did not go well and the couple separated. And that may have been a reason for Godfrey to seek the support of Henry IV it also could have facilitated Henry's progress through the lands of Matilda of Tuscany. But none of that happened. Godfrey the Hunchback was run through by a spear in 1076 whilst answering a call of nature. His early death initiated a long and drawn-out war. Godfrey had appointed his nephew, also Godfrey, to be his successor. Henry IV disagreed and appointed his own son, Conrad, to be duke. After 11 years of war, Godfrey ultimately won the conflict and was appointed Duke of Lower Lothringia. This Godfrey was known as Godfrey of Bouillon after one of his possessions. And if you have some interest in the Middle Ages, this name might strike you as familiar. Maybe this is the first name you hear on this podcast that you find familiar. Godfrey of Bouillon will rise to prominence as the leader of the First Crusade, which will kick off less than a decade from where we are now. The Pope who will start the Crusades, Urban II, had been elected in 1088 by those cardinals loyal to Gregory VII. He had appeared on this episode already because he's none other than Odo, Cardinal Bishop of Ostia and Legate of the Gregorians in Germany. The Gregorian reformers had gradually recovered from the loss of their great leader, the main military supporter, Matilda of Tuscany, had regained her lands after winning a battle against the northern Italian bishops. The Normans had provided the new pope with access to at least part of the city of Rome, with others held by Clement III. And Urban II was a dynamic and competent pope, very much like Gregory VII, and he could bring bishops of his native France, from England, and even some of the cardinals back to the Gregorian side. For Henry and his supporters, it became clear that a true and lasting peace could only be achieved by ending the schism. Only once Clement III was recognised across the whole of Christendom would the Swabians reland. And for that, he had to go back down to Italy and end these Gregorians once and for all. Whether he will achieve that, we will hear next week. I hope to see you then. And in the meantime, should you feel like supporting the show, and get hold of these bonus episodes, sign up on Patreon. The links are in the show notes or on my website at historyofthegermans.com. <laughs>